Hey everybody, it is Nathan with Doctors of Running. Tonight, welcome to my evening q and I got my robe on, got my uh, ginger tea with my Love Run Philly Half Marathon. Ah, good stuff. Um, and today, tonight, we're gonna take it nice and easy. We're gonna be having a Q&A on the ASICS Glide Ride 2. Um, I'm the only one on our team who has tested both the original iteration of this shoe and the updated Glide Ride. So you'll see our written review is out so you can get even more details there. But we fielded some questions from you all, which I have here next to me on the computer. And hopefully I can give some good answers to uh, some of the questions that you're having. This is a fascinating shoe, um, partially because there are I'll, there's a lot of science that's put into this shoe um, and a lot of newer research like the studies that I'll be talking about are from you know 2017 even a 2019 study 2014 so when you have research that, that's that new that's getting integrated into something that's functional for people um, it's kind of exciting so some of the questions that we're answering are going to be yes from the literature but no answers are completely comprehensive or answered uh, from uh, from studies, the ones that I'm talking about are peer reviewed and have been published in different journals, but some of it is going to be based off of what is the, the best theories based on these studies and the mechanics and how they change. So I'll try to make it as clear as possible in terms of when I'm pulling from a study and when it's uh, theory based on what we see clinically um, and uh, kind of what's that what that's looking like. So. This first series of questions is going to be about the rocker of this shoe, but before we do that, just a quick lowdown of the glide ride. So the glide ride is a higher stack shoe, um, comes in a little over 10 ounces in my size nine. Um, and it, you can see here on the shoe, we've got a lot of dust on there, um, that it has this pretty aggressive rocker in the front and just a little bit of a rocker in the heel. So the rocker uh, and the apex of it's right here. The rocker is really focused towards the front of the foot and we're gonna dive into that. This is a daily training option from ASICS and you'll get a lowdown of, of what we think this shoe should be used for in our written review, which you can find on doctorsofrunning.com. So let's start diving into questions. Uh, sorry for any of you if I butcher your name. So the first question that I'm seeing here is from um, Roe Bish. It says, I'd like to hear about the implications of the aggressive rocker, specifically in terms of uh, forces being shifted up the chain away from the foot and ankle. I'm asking because I love the first version, but it strained my hip flexor uh, after I began to run in them often. And so he's thinking about the new version, but not sure if it's the way he should go. So there's a study out um, by uh, Sobani, and they were looking at how do you create rocker sole shoes and what does that do to the forces in the uh, entire kinetic chain. So they looked at forces through the ankle, they looked at forces through the knee, and they looked at forces through the hip. And so when they looked at the loading through the ankle, that one way to measure how much uh, load a joint is taking is looking at work that the joint is doing. So they looked at how much work was happening in the calf, because the original goal of some of the issues was to offload the calf um, and decrease the amount of work it had to do. So when they tested rocker sole shoes compared to regular shoes, they found that the heel, um, both when you were landing as well as when you were taking off in propulsion, there was uh, less work done by the calf. So they found compared to regular shoes for positive work, which meant propulsion, 16% less energy was used in a rocker sole shoe compared to original in the calf and 32% less uh, energy and work was done in the calf from uh, energy absorption. So the, the calf controlling the forward movement of the tibia. At the same time though, uh, this is what pretty much answers the question. Um, there was a decrease in workload at the ankle, but the workload up at the knee increased. So you're looking at um, an increase of positive work at the knee of 14%. So just that in and of itself is telling us, hey, you're decreasing loads down at the ankle, but the amount of work having to be done is up at the knee. And this is pretty consistent with what's been thought of, that it, you can't dissipate force, you can't get rid of it, but you can shift it. So just because the ankle is doing less doesn't mean that there's less energy or less work being done by the body. Um, it's just being shifted somewhere else. And so you talked about having hip pain. Uh, one, one idea that could be going on, they didn't look at the hip. They only looked at the ankle and the knee and it's shown that there's more work at the knee um, compared to with regular shoes. But 
what could be happening is as you're doing pr uh, progression and toe off and propulsion, if the calf is doing less work to, to advance your limb, um, you're rolling off the shoe, but you might use your hip flexors to bring and advance your limb forward instead of using the um, kinetic energy built up from your calf to, to propulse the limb. So that could be, could be a factor. Whether or not you in particular should be getting the shoe, that's, that, you know, that's outside of what I can talk about right now. But uh, yes, load, it's been shown with rocker sole shoes that load gets shifted from the ankle, it's decreased at the ankle and moved up to the knee. So just a fun little thing, the reason that people started working on rocker sole shoes was to try to decrease load on the Achilles and working for people with Achilles tendinopathy. So that's one thing that's thought about with these shoes. Let's go to the next question here about uh, rockers. It says, what does it mean for me that the rocker shape, oh, this is raised by Wolf. What does it mean for that the rocker shape for me on shoes like this almost makes it feel harder on my legs to run? I tried them, but I find myself continuously more comfortable in less cushioned and more flexible shoes. So there's, gonna, there's actually some really interesting things with that. Um, two, two things that we can note. One is that there's a new study that was just done uh, looking at running economy in acute changes of people uh, uh, running in rocker sole shoes. And which is pretty, this is pretty consistent with any drastic change in the type of footwear that people go into, but it is shown that when people uh, in the acute phase, when they switch to uh, a rocker sole shoe compared to a traditional running shoe, which is more flexible, that running economy went down for these people in that acute stage, meaning right away. So they didn't, they didn't measure if, if you kept wearing the shoe for six months, does it get better? They didn't answer that, but they did find that at least right away, um, it, your running economy did go down, which could explain part of why it's harder. Or the other option is maybe this person, maybe raised by Wolf, if you're somebody who does utilize your calf a lot, um, and, and that's one of the stronger areas of your running, we know that since they're shifting loads up the chain, it could be that you're a little bit weaker in some of the other muscles that have more demand on them and need to do more work. So you're not getting to utilize your personal strongest thing and something else that's weaker is having to carry some load. Again, that's uh, conjecture because I don't know you, but uh, that, could be, that could be a possibility. All right, and then this final question about rockers uh, is from Tugboat. It says, how do these thick rocker soled shoes affect your gait? Are the effects a good thing? Um, and he says, I like this, he or she, uh, likely a solid maybe, methinks. <laughs> um, do these rockers, uh, do these new rockers that are all the rage actually help improve running economy or is it just a vehicle to make thick, cushy and sometimes stiff sole runnable? So uh, I think we've kind of answered some of this, but um, one of the questions we have is, how does this affect your gait? So they did a study where they put people in rocker sole shoes, they, where they put people in their regular shoes, tracked how they ran, looked at what's called their kinematics and kinetics, meaning the joints uh, and the angles that they're going through as well as the forces going through them. And then they had them go into a rocker sole shoe and they compared them and they were the same for the mechanics. And then they had them run for a long period of time, brought them back a number of weeks later, and they reassessed the mechanics. And what they found is that there were no changes in the mechanics. So this is one study, but it is one study that showed that the mechanics don't change, but the load and the work that's done by the joints does change. Um, so it doesn't really affect your gait, and it's all gonna depend on if shifting that load is right for you. So um, we go, I go into this into the review and our thoughts as a DPT section, but you know, for people with Achilles issues, this could be an option since it is shown to decrease load through the calf. Could be something that um, that could be a tool for you to use um, as you keep trying to get back into running pain-free. Um, I also think it ties into what ASICS claims about, they're, they're saying that it's scientifically proven to save energy. Um, uh, we've reached out to them, we haven't been able to hear kind of exactly what they mean by that or what kind of studies they've done. Um, one of the things I think it could mean is that if I were to complete their sentence, and this is conjecture, this isn't truth, but it could mean that it's scientifically proven to save energy in the calf. Um, I think that could be a very, very true statement. Um, doesn't mean that the total amount of energy is saved, but energy in the calf, but they could have studies that I don't know about, but that would at least make sense with the research that we have. The other, um, Oh, the other population that I think that these rockers can be helpful for um, 
and, and this is in the, is this a good thing or is it not? And it is a maybe, but for people who have issues with their, their first ray, the big toe, and they don't have a lot of mobility or a lot of, um, and they have pain, metatarsalgia, maybe some arthritis, this can be a vehicle that you can roll off the toe and the uh, rocker is mimicking that uh, four foot rocker, which means where we would normally extend off of the big toe. And so if you don't have that extension, this can be a nice tool to decrease the demand on the mobility. So again, it could be a good thing for some people who have, um, have other issues in their knees. Maybe this isn't your best option. Um, and at the same time, it could be just fine. And there's a lot more to say about that, but this is supposed to be a quick Q and A and I think I'm going way too fast. So um, these are in more general questions. Um, this is from Will and Pull. And it says, is it wider in the forefoot area? Any break in period for the shoe? Uh, and then uh, Humps B asked, I'm interested in the forefoot dimension too. Um, had to get rid of V1 because they rubbed the inside of my big toe. So this is definitely a big change from the original version to now. They really, I think they really honed in what this upper uh, should be to match the function of the shoe. So the first version was really really thick the entire the entire shoe was really thick um, In the forefoot it had a layered mesh engineered mesh and then the heel was just like this very thick padding as well as the tongue Everything is is slimmed down a bit. So now it rides more of like a traditional upper um, Not like a premium thick upper. So it's a lot thinner. There is more room I found throughout I actually had to really tie myself down if I wanted to get a good lock into the shoe. Otherwise it was just, a I just had a lot of space all the way from the heel um, up to the forefoot. Part of the forefoot that, um, that is nice for creating some volume is the toe guard. It has a, a really good structure to it. It's, it's flexible. It's not like it's going to rub on you or anything, but it does hold the upper uh, away from the, the foot so that it can really expand. So um, just trying to see rubbed on the inside of the big toe. I don't think you're going to have an issue. The shaping of this is, is relatively wide, but they do, they are coming out with a wide option for this shoe. So um, that could be an option. In terms of break-in period, I wouldn't say that there's a break-in period. This is a really stiff shoe. Um, it's built the way that Rocker Soul shoes are studied. Um, they basically found that you're going to need a combination of a certain angle of the rocker as well as a stiffness. Um, of the shoe so that it doesn't it doesn't have flexibility uh, because you want the rocker to do the work and not the shoe to flex. So this has a plate that runs through the forefoot. So in terms of breaking, it's not really the shoe breaking in. It's more of you breaking into the shoe, getting used to how it runs because it's it's very very different. This forefoot rocker is quite aggressive, um, and uh, I'm going to use the word severe because even when you're the first time I put on this shoe. I felt like I was gonna fall forward onto my toes. Like I just had to stand a little bit further back or you're you're going forward. So this is, um, I kind of say you gotta break into the shoe. The shoe doesn't have a break-in period. All right, next we got um, Technical Pop 2504. Um, wow, wow, that's so beautiful for the shoe. How much does it cost? Um, you know what? I should have looked this up before. The original version was coming in at 150 and I believe it's the same. It won't take me long to look this up. Let's see. I actually don't have the price listed. We didn't get that info from, from ASIC, so sorry everybody. I just wasted about 30 seconds of your time. Forgive me. <laughs> All right. Um, this is Benny Ow House or Ben Yao House. I've been avoiding shoes with overly aggressive toe springs as I'm afraid it will, uh, it'll disengage my foot muscles. Would be interested to hear your thoughts regarding uh, this on this shoe. So he's talking about, uh, we talked about the decrease in workload in the calf um, and the increased workload in the knee. He's wondering, hey, if we, have a, if we have a shoe that's mimicking the work of the foot and let's say the foot has to do less, is that gonna disengage your foot and is it gonna decrease the amount of work the foot is doing? We don't have evidence to say that. The evidence right now is not looking at what's happening in the foot itself. It's not looking at the intrinsic, which means muscles that in, uh, originate and attach in the foot. All we really have seen in the research right now is what's happening at the calf. So if anything, there's gonna be a little bit less workload at the calf 
um, which could lead to less, if you have less of a stimulus, you're gonna have less strength. That's kind of like a, an idea, but it's not severe. So you're not gonna get like an atrophied calf from using a shoe like this. It's not that magic. Um, but you might notice a little bit different work in your calf and if you transition back to a traditional shoe, you might get some sore calves. Um, as for the foot itself, the foot still needs to have a, like, a stable platform uh, on there on itself. The one thing that it's not going to use um, is what's called the windlass mechanism. So when we extend our first toe, um, we get a stiffening and a rigiding of the, uh, the, um, the plantar fascia and all of the tissues that run from the heel up to the forefoot. And, and that creates a rigid lever to, to toe off. So you won't really be utilizing that here, but that's passive structures and not necessarily active structures. Your foot is still gonna need to be stable on the platform, which runs the same. It's not like your toes are getting pulled up on the platform. It's still pretty much a flat platform um, that your foot itself is actually on. So I don't see this disengaging foot muscles. Again, if anything, it's just gonna be a little bit of change in the utilization of your calf. All right, and then Vic238 asks, would you recommend the Glide Ride 2 for a beginner? Uh, been running for a month with the 1080 V10. Um, they've got 115 kilometers so far. The majority of the runs are easy runs uh, to build aerobic base, interested in ASICs if they make a wide version. So yes, they're making a wide version for this shoe. Whether this shoe is for a beginner, that's a great question. If if I had, so my, my biggest population that I work with are people who come into my physical therapy clinic. Um, if somebody was coming in interested in running, this is not a shoe that I would I would throw their way. I would go something a lot more traditional, like you're wearing the 1080 V10. I think that's a great, a great option. That doesn't mean new runners shouldn't run in this, but it's a very unique running experience. Um, but that, that said, if, if someone that I saw came in who's in that special population that I think this shoe might benefit them, then I might, even if they're a new runner or not even someone who runs, but somebody who walks, who's having issues with their metatarsal joints and things like that, that's where I would maybe, regardless of their experience, send them this direction. But um, because of how strange the, the, the ride is initially, it wouldn't be my gut for a new runner, but that doesn't mean that you might not have fun in it. Um, so that's kind of a, it, it's really up to you, but it wouldn't be my first, my first choice. Um, oh, one other tidbit, some fun things. I don't know if this, if the light on my, on my GoPro will, uh, help, but the, the laces have some reflective nature in them, which is kind of nice. And then you get a reflective band in the back. So a little bit of reflection from the shoe. Okay. Time for some comparison questions. Um, Ryan's winter says they look a lot like the Saucony Endorphin Speed, especially the overlays at the heel and the way the midsole wraps up onto the upper. I wonder if it performs like it. Um, somebody else on Reddit was asking, beautiful shoes, how does it compare to the Endorphin Speed? So a lot of Endorphin Speed questions. Uh, very different from the Endorphin Speed. So yes, both have a little bit of a toe spring. Uh, that's what the speed roll is in, um, in the endorphin line, but this shoe uh, runs m much more like a daily trainer. So you can pick up the pace in it, but it's it's it shines at a little bit slower speeds and it runs very uniquely because of how aggressive the forefoot is. So it doesn't feel anything like it. It doesn't feel like a bouncy shoe. Um, it's kind of just more of a, it's got some, some cushion to it, but it's really a firm, stiff platform that rolls nicely because of the geometry of the shoe. So I, I wouldn't compare it to the Endorphin Speed. Um, if anything, uh, I'm gonna probably answer a, a future question. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Mike San 93 What shoes from other brands is it similar to? Um, where does it fit in a runner's rotation? So I'll kind of line that question in here. I think what this most uh, lines up for with me is the Endorphin Shift. So the shift is, is the kind of uh, daily trainer side of the endorphin line, high stack, um, very stiff, kind of firm. It uses their power run midsole. So it's just an EVA blend, just like this one. Um, it just has a less aggressive toe spring. So, and it's only four millimeter drop. This one's five. So pretty similar in a lot of specs, a little bit higher stack um, in the endorphin shift compared to the Glide Ride 2, but they both are higher stack, stiffer throughout, just an EVA for midsole and kind of roll off. I would say that's the closest thing to this shoe would be the Endorphin Shift. If you go into other brands, the only other brand that I really have a comparison for um, 
that I've been able to run in is really any of the neutral Hoka trainers. So the, the biggest similarity is that they again are using an EVA um, uh, platform. The biggest differences though are that Hoka's platforms on the Rincon, which is probably the one that I've run in that's most similar, um, is, is softer and it's not reinforced with a plate. Um, and that the rocker for the, for the Rincon starts a lot earlier. So for the Rincon, it feels like the rocker's always in play, whereas with the Glide Ride 2, it feels like the rocker only comes into play at toe off. So uh, those would be the most similar comparisons with other brands. All right. Uh, this is Europa Holzer. He said, how does it compare to, the, to version one? I'm on my second pair of ones. Love them for any run other than a recovery run. Um, I do find you have to get into the zone with them. I agree. Um, and then somebody else from Reddit. This is Lay10W. How you like these? I recently bought V1. Um, and while they're comfortable, they feel weird on the foot. Also agreed. Granted, they've only worn them for a couple of runs. Curious about what others' experience have been with these. So, comparing to version one, uh, the biggest similarity is going to be how that toe spring uh, feels on the foot. The biggest difference is the stability of the shoe. I found version one to be, especially in the heel, really unstable. And um, I think that ASICS did a phenomenal job with this update in terms of creating a stable platform in this higher stack shoe. Um, in version one, uh, if we look at the heel of the shoe, in version one, instead of having just a, a pretty standard connection from the heel to the forefoot, just like this one here, they had this pretty, on the lateral side, they had a pretty major kind of cut out where it went like this and you had two parts of the midsole kind of coming together. And I just found that, that having that little uh, wedge would compress a lot. So I felt like there was a lot of medial lateral movement, especially in the heel. Whereas in this one, they've kind of filled all of that in and it's a lot simpler. Um, they have some, some nice guide rails and side, or not guide rails, but side walls where the, like the midsole um, comes up around the foot. So when I put my finger down here, your foot actually sits way down here instead of up at the top. So you're sitting down here and this is kind of, there's a little bit of guidance for your foot. And then they also widened the, the platform on the bottom. So all of that just makes this a, a lot more stable. But uh, if you like or don't like the feel of that forefoot, um, toe off, that's uh, pretty much the same between the two models. And um, in the, in, when, I re, when I ran in the first one, it honestly took me like 25, 30 miles before I felt comfortable in the shoe. I really had to get used to it. So it sounds like my experience is pretty similar with uh, late 10W. Um, so keep, keep going at it. it might, you might settle in just like um, your upper holes are, have to get in the zone with it. I agree. All right. Um, Roy Chewy is asking, should I get the Glide Ride 2 and Evo Ride 2 and why? So I haven't ran in the Evo Ride 2, so I reached out to David. Um, he has tested both of the these versions, both the Evo Ride and Glide Ride 2s. Um, and what he said is they're, they're pretty similar. If you haven't ran in uh, one of these rocker sold shoes, the Evo Ride is more like an introduction. It feels more like an introduction into it a hybrid between a classic trainer and a rocker sold trainer. Um, and it's just gonna be a little bit faster, it's lighter, it's a little bit lower to the ground. Um, and he's just, he really, really likes that shoe, it's versatile. Um, whereas he says this, the, the Glide Ride 2 for him is definitely more of a, a long run, daily miles, some recovery. I don't really like it for recovery, um, but they, they are a little bit different. Um, but he kind of said you can you can pretty much get what you need out of either one if you want one that's a little bit more versatile maybe go evo ride if you want something higher stack a little bit more protection on your foot uh, glide ride would be the option all right so that is everything that i've got in the q a last little tidbit for you guys is that i am in wisconsin and so i'm testing right now all my testing is basically in the snow um we've been in a quite the freeze lately where most mornings are, you know, negative 10, negative 15, and then wind chill on top of that. So one of the things that I obviously pay attention to is grip of the outsole. And uh, 
this one's been tough for, for those winter runs um, and being on the snow. Like if I had to choose one shoe that, I, that carried me through the whole year, this probably wouldn't be it because of the traction on snow. Wet surfaces, which I've been on plenty with when sometimes when snow melts, um, and, and pavement and, and some light trails, it's totally fine. Um, you might get a couple rocks stuck in here, but when it comes to running on a thin layer of snow, hasn't, haven't, I haven't had as much luck. So um, that's something just to keep in mind. Otherwise, uh, again, this is the ASICS Glide Ride 2. A lot of updates. Um, they're subtle, but they, I think they're important and really good thinning out the upper and filling in the midsole to make a lot more stable ride. Thanks, guys.